Story 1. Back in the early 1990s when I was married, we had the beginnings of the Internet in Brisbane, Australia. My husband now ex-collected military insignia and did trades with military members from all over the world. They posted pictures of what they would trade, and others responded with photos of what they would receive in exchange. Now on to the story. I came home one Friday night after work, and my husband was upset. After getting the boys settled, I got him to tell me the problem. He had organized a military insignia trade with the United States Marine. He had sent his items to the Marine months prior, but had received nothing in return. Each time he contacted the Marine, he was given conflicting excuses as to why the trade items had not been posted to him. He now thought he was being scammed and would never receive the trade items. This had been going on for months. My husband was scrupulously honest and was very upset that a fellow military person would scam him. Being the sort of person I am, I was very angry on his behalf. But what could we do? The trade person was half a world away in the United States. Well, I also used to watch the TV show JAG every week. I copied every message conversation my husband and the Marine had had. I saved and sorted them and uploaded them onto a special website I created using HTML code I had taught myself. I pulled an all-nighter, working from 8 p.m. Friday night until 10 p.m. Saturday night. It was all laid out in spectacular honesty. I then searched for the Marine and found out his full name, address, rank, unit, commanding officer, base where he was posted, and more basically every bit of free information I could locate. I uploaded all that information to the new website as well. From 10 p.m. Saturday night to 2 a.m. Sunday morning, I gathered the email addresses of as many United States military bases as I could find all over the world. At 2 a.m. on Sunday morning, I sent the link to that website to every email address I had found United States Army, Marine, Air Force, JAG, embassies, etc., all over the world. Then I went to bed and slept. I woke up Sunday afternoon to a phone call from a ranking officer in the United States Marines. All the items my husband had sent the Marine for trade were being posted back to him using the fastest air freight. All trade items that were agreed upon were also being posted to my husband using the fastest air freight. The ranking officer wanted to know how much time went into my website and what my hourly rate of pay was in my administration job. I told him, and he said that money to the value of my hourly rate times the hours I put into the website would also be heading our way. I stated that once my husband's items were returned, I was more than willing to pull down the website. I respected the military from all countries. I just did not want the Marine to be able to scam anyone else like he had tried to do to my husband. I was told not to worry about the Marine he was being managed by his superiors, and we would never hear from him again. Yes, we did receive everything and quite fast for back then. Story 2 This is the story of how a friend of mine dismantled the timeshare scam a few years back and took them to the cleaners. Background, a friend of mine is a big guy, maybe 6 3 inches and 250 pounds, and a no-nonsense military non-commissioned officer. He likes to have fun and a good time when he's off the clock. We'll call him JB. One day he got one of those win a free week-long cruise, all expenses paid phone calls. He decided to look into it because why not? He called the number back and got a lady who gave him the rundown of how the cruise worked. It sounded too good to be true, so he asked her, is there some sort of timeshare nonsense or other strings attached to this? She assured him that there was not. He went for it and signed up for a cruise a few months later during a block of leave. In order to claim the cruise, he and his wife had to show up a day early to a hotel near the port where the cruise was departing. The room was already paid for as part of the cruise package. They showed up the day before and checked in at the front desk. The concierge asked if they'd like to upgrade to the VIP package for $1.20s, which included free drinks at the hotel bar. Of course. He took the upgrade and headed to the bar. JB is a social drinker, and when he gets liquored up, he starts socializing with the other bar patrons. He found out that they were also there for the cruise and that there was a mandatory presentation the next morning that everyone had to attend. JB started to smell a rat. This sounded a lot like a timeshare scam. Well, he was having none of it and being good and drunk. He rallied all the cruise goers around him about 30 people, got up on a table, and delivered a William Wallace-style speech about how they don't have to deal with these timeshare scam artists. Within minutes, he whipped the crowd into a frenzy and convinced everyone not to buy into whatever the presentation was selling. 
Sure enough, the next morning, everyone showed up to the presentation to claim their crews. They were told the tickets would be given to them at the conclusion of the presentation. JB was drunk again because, well, free booze and he was on leave. JB started to go back into Braveheart mode, getting real loud about how it was a scam, and he was told explicitly that there was no timeshare nonsense attached to this cruise. The timeshare people instantly recognized JB was bad for business, so they ushered him away from everyone else into a side room and tried to talk sense into him. The timeshare scammer said, Sir, this is a mandatory presentation. We cannot give you a ticket for the cruise unless you attend. JB responded, Nonsense. You all specifically said there was no timeshare involved in this cruise. The timeshare scammer replied, Sir, we have all our calls recorded, and it was very clearly outlined that you need to listen to this presentation. JB retorted, Good, let's pull up my recording, and you show me when they said that. At this point, a big beefy security-looking guy not with the hotel, clearly a part of the timeshare company, tried to intervene because JB was getting louder and angrier. The security guard said, Sir, we're going to have to. JB interrupted. Back up, you jerk. I will rip off your head and crawl down your neck. The security guard meekly turned tail and backed off. It was clear that they couldn't let JB into the presentation, or he'd ruin everything. So the director of the program pulled JB into his office. The director admitted that they weren't able to print his ticket until 12.30 p.m. the time the presentation was scheduled to end because the company locked them to force people to attend the presentations. He said, come back at 1230, I'll have your tickets, and I will upgrade you to premium for free if you just don't go anywhere near our presentation. Too easy, JB did exactly that, and then headed to the boat. Premium was like the best cabin on the boat with, again, free booze and all sorts of awesome upgrades, including $5,000 on his account. It turns out everyone else who had to sit through the timeshare presentation almost missed the boat because it went so long. Not a single person bought a timeshare, and the presenter spent hours trying to convince them to. Eventually, they gave up and handed everyone their tickets in defeat. In total, they made $0 in sales and lost another $5,000 to JB's free premium upgrade. Story 3 A recent story reminded me of a similar story by a family member. This family member's spouse was involved in an accident that left them critically injured. They were in intensive care for months and would face permanent disability upon returning home. They didn't want to leave their home. It was close to the best hospital in the region, and it was their forever home, so plans began to renovate it for accessibility. In addition to the renovations, a wheelchair van and other medical equipment for home use were needed. As she worked on all of this, it became clear that large expenditures were needed, and it would take time to draw money out of long-term savings and retirement accounts. So she called the credit card companies to get their limits increased. Sadly, before the renovations were complete, her spouse passed away after almost six months of hospitalization and therapy. Now attention turned to final arrangements. The couple had always been very frugal and maintained nearly perfect credit. All cards were being paid on time, and despite carrying a balance on some cards from the construction demolition had already started, so renovations had to continue, but at a slower pace. Money was now coming in from those long-term savings. The problem was one major credit card company refused to work with her. She tried to access the account and was told, Sorry, I have to speak to the account holder. She explained that her spouse had passed away and she wanted to pay what was left on the card. She also explained that she was an account holder. The bank stated that she was not on the account. She was merely a card holder and she had no rights to the account. The person on the phone explained that her husband opened the account without her and just gave her the card. She just didn't understand how credit cards worked. This was a lie. The couple had always been joint account holders on everything since they were first married for exactly this reason. They had done extensive estate planning and made sure that all their assets were protected in trust should the worst occur. They knew their kids would be cared for and their partner would be able to access everything. Also, she ran the couple's business for over a decade, navigating a sea of regulations, insurance company billing, and payroll slash finances slash taxes. Needless to say, she did not enjoy being condescended to. Unfortunately, the bank would not budge. They would not allow any access to the account for any reason. But for some reason, they didn't cancel the card after finding out the sole account holder had passed away. This back and forth went on for weeks with multiple calls to the bank, 
trying to escalate the issue to supervisors to address the state of the account. In a final attempt to show the bank that they were hurting themselves, she said, so I'm unable to access any part of the account, even to make a payment? The bank replied, that's right. So the account is going to be closed, she asked. No, only the account holder can do that, the bank responded. Even though the account holder is deceased? Yes, only the account holder, ma'am. So what does that mean for cardholders and being able to charge on the account? Only the account holder can deactivate a card or modify the account. So what happens if a cardholder uses their card? They can continue to use the card until the account holder tells us otherwise. The deceased account holder. Yes, I can't help you with anything else. You need to put the account holder on the phone if you want to change anything or make a payment. No, that's fine. She broke down crying immediately after but decided that they set the rules, so she would play by them. All the final expenses, medical bills, and as much construction cost as possible were put onto that credit card. She maxed it out and then let it sit until the credit card company started calling for payment. I'm sorry, per your policy, I'm just the cardholder, and I'm not responsible for any balance. Ma'am, this balance needs to be paid, or it will affect your credit. It better not. I'm not on the account. This is an illegal collections call, and I will be reporting it to the Federal Trade Commission and the Attorneys General in your home state and mine. I still have his number on the speed dial. You can make your case to the court. She was used to getting medical insurance companies to pay claims for the last decade or so. You didn't want to play hardball with her. Remember how all the assets were in trust. On paper, her partner had no assets to place a lien on. All the cash in the joint checking account had been used to pay expenses for the last several months, and withdrawals from long-term savings were sent to her account, not the joint account. They had agreed to move all exposed assets shortly after her partner regained consciousness, fearing the worst. Plus, all the income from the business had been brought home in her name for more than a decade, so she would actually get some kind of social security payment when she got older. So not only did his estate have no assets to go after, he didn't have an income for the last decade. The bank was left with a maxed-out credit card and no assets in the estate they could file against for payment. A handful of other credit card companies worked with her to raise limits temporarily or remove daily spending caps for large expenditures, and they were all paid without a single missed, late, or partial payment. The bank had to eat a five-figure loss all because they decided that the wife didn't deserve to be on the account from day one. She had every intention to pay every bill and expense. She has never been one to try to scam or cheat someone. She gave the bank every chance to accept money for the bill. They repeatedly refused to acknowledge her as a spouse or executor, but she sure likes the irony of the only company that refused to acknowledge the death of her spouse ended up paying for the funeral expenses. Story 4 This happened at a small outdoor live music event. The budget was tiny, so the event had a bare-bones setup consisting of a drum set, a couple of amplifiers and mics, and all that goes to a mixer board I'm not a sound guy, so I don't know the terms. The soundman hired for the show looked more like a bodyguard or a bouncer at a club, a huge skinhead guy wearing all black and looking intimidating. As the show got underway, it was clear that the sound was terrible. Thanks to the soundman fiddling with the mixer, the sound swung back and forth between muddy and screeching feedback. He was probably attempting to improve things, but it wasn't working. Then, while one band was leaving and another starting to set up, unbearably loud feedback started happening. Everyone had to cover their ears until the soundman brought the volume down. A teenager shouted at the soundman, Hey, cut the highs, man, cut the highs. The big intimidating soundman didn't like this one bit. Hey, you think you're so smart? Why don't you come down here and be the soundman? Wait, really? Are you serious, said the team. Yeah, come down here and be the soundman if you're so smart or shut your mouth. The team walked over to the mixer. The kid clearly knew what he was doing because he didn't hesitate with any of the knobs and levels. He then asked the band to do a quick sound check, going through all the levels of each mic, including the drums. Everything took maybe five minutes. When the band started their set, it was obvious to everyone that the sound was much better. The big intimidating soundman was red-faced. He didn't touch the mixer after that. 